Welcome to the Glenn Beck Program. America, I think we've grown a little too accustomed to seeing scenes like this from the Middle East. We have, we have seen this kind of hatred for a long time, hatred towards American and the Western way of life, and Israel is becoming so commonplace that I believe we're desensitized to it and our media doesn't show it. I believe we are back in the 1990s, 1998. I had a hard time convincing New Yorkers when I was on the radio in uh, New York. I had a hard time convincing them trouble was on the way from Osama bin Laden. I said this. Are you absolutely ready to wage war against terrorism? As you see body parts of your neighbor or somebody that you were driving to work with, or as you come out of a uh, store uh, downtown and uh, you see that a child has been blown up and the side of a building is gone, are you still going to support it? I warned at that time that there was problems coming and no one would take Osama bin Laden seriously. No one would listen then. And I think it's because it's too horrific to think. You don't want to think that people actually mean death to America, death to Israel, and mean the actual people, but they do. We look at these pictures and we refuse to see in the crowd that was celebrating freedom. This is uh, Tahrir Square in Egypt. In this very crowd, at this very time, they were raping CBS News' Lara Logan while chanting, Jew, Jew, Jew. It is time for people to stand up. It is time for people to say what they mean and mean what they say. It is time for the media to call these kinds of actions and these chants by name. This is evil, period. Tonight, you will see a different perspective. One I ask you to DVR and share with a friend, because it's one you won't see anywhere else. Maybe it's laziness, maybe it just doesn't fit the agenda. I don't know, I don't care anymore. The truth you will see tonight is the truth without an agenda. Hello, America. Uh, tonight, I am going to continue my quest to try to wake uh, America and the world up on something that I believe we're ahead of the curve on yet again. But this one could be for the whole ball of wax. The hatred against Israel and the Jewish people is nothing new. And when you begin to understand its history, you begin to understand the Middle East, and you begin to see what is coming our way. I'm going to try to show that to you tonight. The level of hatred that is is in the Middle East has always been um, high, but it is growing now into something much more dark and much more sinister than anything the world has experienced since the 1930s. The links that people have to go to to ignore it in the media and your neighbors to bury their heads in the sand and not see it is stunning. Yesterday in the news, we have a prominent Iranian cleric. Now this is Mahmoud Ahmadinejad's spiritual mentor. He came out yesterday urging followers to ramp up suicide attacks against the Israelis. He says they're legitimate and a must for every Muslim. He even believes it's okay for suicide bombing attacks to target Israeli children. May I ask you, good or evil? Say it and speak it by its name. Do not tolerate it. Now, this is in a region that just had Nakba Day protests. 90 days ago, I couldn't even told you what Nakba meant. Now, I have educated myself and I see what it means. Nakba is the great catastrophe. Nakba Day, the day of the great catastrophe. What is the great catastrophe? The day of independence for Israel, the founding of independence of uh, Israel. 
It would be like um, the rest of the world celebrating the 4th of July while chanting kill the Americans and meaning it. These people were in the streets over the last couple of weeks not just encouraging but salivating over the slaughter of Jews. They rushed the borders, they instigated clashes with Israeli border security, and there is another flotilla now planned. There is also something new now on Facebook again. The youth of June 5th. This is pro-Palestinian groups. Remember, not anti-Israelis. No, they've learned. Pro-Palestinian groups. They are planning yet another bro uh, border protest this Sunday. This is going to protest the anniversary of the Six-Day War. You know, those, those uh, borders that the president keeps talking about? This is the anniversary of those borders. They want, they want those all across the Arab world to rush the Israeli borders from Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and Gaza. Hit them from all sides. They're planning this this Sunday. I told you yesterday that they would rush the Israeli borders to force the Israelis to shoot them. They will. I don't know if it will be this Sunday, but they will. When that happens, it just depends on who can, has control of the media and if Americans and the rest of the world understand that you're being set up, and so is Israel. People don't understand why I keep harping on Israel. Well, because you need to know you're being set up. People will say, well, they've hated each other for years. The Jews and the Palestinians and the Arabs, they've been going at it for thousands of years. They're never going to sell it. I don't care. Let them attack each other. I can relate to that because I used to be the same exact way uh, up until really after 9-11. It took me about a year to really begin to understand the importance. If you've listened to my radio program for a long period of time, um, you know that when September 11th happened, people called me and asked and said, how did this happen? Why did this happen? And I said, I'm not sure yet, but I will try to find an answer. I made my first trip over to the Middle East right after September 11th, and I found my answers. It took me about a year, but I found my answers. If you've listened to me, you know that I was on the Iranian story um, and the Muslim extremist story for a very long time. Over at the other network, I was the one that brought you a special that was, believe me, over at the other network, it was like pulling teeth to get it done. To show you Muslim extremists in their own words. That hadn't been done before on American television until I was over there. Um, I know this story. I know who these people are. I know what we're up against. We are up against, and so is Israel, the exact same people that flew planes into the World Trade Center. But that's not their way they're being imaged now. They've learned. It is no longer an acceptable position for Americans or anyone on the face of the earth to close their eyes. Um, not because we have the responsibility to protect, as the president says, but because self-ignorance, self-imposed ignorance, is dangerous. It is dangerous to the Jews, it is dangerous to Israel, it is dangerous to the world, it is dangerous to the United States, it is dangerous to you and your soul, quite frankly. I've told you, as Israel goes, so goes the Western world. They are the keystone to freedom in the Middle East. If they fall, we all fall. Tonight, I'm going to show you history. I've got less than an hour now, so we're going to have to race through this program. But you need to have some perspective on where this hatred has come from. Please pardon the sloppiness because we're going to cover, we're going to cover 2,000 years quickly. Um, but I urge you to do your own homework and look these things up for yourself. People tend to forget that our society is based on the history of the Jews. When you go to the Supreme Court building, try looking up. You'll see this over the door. You will see a row of the world's lawgivers. Right in the middle is Moses, and he is holding the Ten Commandments. Moses is also featured in the House chamber, where the President gives his State of the Union address. The Statue of Liberty, most people think she's wearing a crown, but she's not wearing a crown. If you've ever been over to, um, or you've seen um, Michelangelo's Moses, he's carved him with horns. That's because of a mistranslation of the scriptures. It's not horns, it's rays of light. 
This isn't a crown, this is the rays of the sun or the rays of light coming from behind her. The tablets in her arms represent the moment Moses descends Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments, it's the law, and the ray of light from God on her head. There's a quote from Moses on the Liberty Bell. The Pennsylvania Assembly chose, proclaim liberty throughout the land to all the inhabitants thereof. That's from Leviticus. It's on the Liberty Bell. Jefferson, Franklin, John Adams led a committee designed um, uh, to come up with the seal of the United States. You've seen the seal of the United States a million times, but this isn't what they originally designed. The original design was this. It was Moses leading the Israelites across the Red Sea with a pillar of fire keeping the Pharaoh at bay. Around the seal, it doesn't say e pluribus unum, it says rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. That's our original seal. And they all center around Exodus and Moses. These are just a few examples of the influence that Moses has had on us. There are many, many more. It is impossible to argue that we are indeed a Judeo-Christian country. Given the spectacular results of basing a country on those principles and values, most people are cool with that. Most people now are growing apathetic, however, and they're like, whatever. Because we're too far removed from the types of religious oppression of the Founders' era. And we are too far removed from the religious oppression that is happening currently in the Middle East. As we sleep, those vocal few who don't like freedom of religion have made progress. And they have worked feverishly to fundamentally transform America. But they haven't. If you change, if you fundamentally transform America, the greatest country ever created in the history of the planet, you should clearly explain to people what you plan to change to. What are you going to change into? But nobody has done that. It's just change. And that's what's happening in the Middle East. Well, what does that change mean? No one is willing to lay that out for you. No one's willing that, to lay that out for the American people, not even the president. I will. I have, and I will continue tonight. The science is settled. We are a Judeo-Christian society. The argument is whether we will remain a Judeo-Christian society that not only tolerates, but embraces and protects all other points of view so long as you are not trying to blow things or people up. That is what is at question. Will we remain that country? Tonight, the history of the hatred in the Middle East. And I want you to know that there is hatred from all religions, all sides. Everybody has a little bit of blood on their hands here. We are talking about 5,000 years of history. There are no sacred cows, but there also are no accusations historically tonight. Only what is happening on the ground today. And again, the question is not who has blood on their hands in the past. The question is, will we put fresh blood on our hands today? It all starts in Syria. 70, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 175 to uh, 163 BC. It was the king of Syria. He was the first to try and outlaw Judaism. He was, um, he was angry. He thought people, uh, Jews, were the reason his people were opposing his policies. So he started making all kinds of laws, such as outlawing the Sabbath and circumcision, which was in interesting when I was reading this last night because what a coincidence. In San Francisco, this November, they're actually voting on banning circumcision. Huh. We'll get back to that later. We have the Crusades that were killing the Christians and the Jews and the Muslims. We have that. It was, it was an awful bloody time. In 1215, Pope Innocent III decreed that Jews should wear a solid yellow circle sewn into an upper garment. He said, Jews are doomed to wander about the earth as fugitives and vagabonds, and their faces must be covered with shame. Remember the yellow circle. In 1240, King Louis IX ordered the Talmud be put on trial in Paris and ended up burning thousands of copies of it. He ordered the expulsion of many Jews and confiscated their lands for his use. In 1290, King Edward expelled uh, the Jews from England. 1306, 1394, Jews were kicked out of France. 1394, Jews expelled from Hungary. 1421, they're kicked out of Austria. You're seeing a pattern? 1492, 
200,000 Jews were expelled from Spain when Columbus were sailing the ocean blue. The reason? They were afraid Jews would taint newly converted Christians. 1445 to 1495, same thing was happening in Lithuania. Pattern, you got it? 1497, the Jews are expelled from Portugal. This time is also the time that marked the start of Jews not being permitted at all in Russia for 200 years. 1543, Martin Luther. This is the guy who fundamentally changed Christianity, but he's also the guy that penned the Jews and their lies. His recommendation was for violence, burning synagogues, destroying their homes, confiscating Jewish holy books, confiscating property, forcing physical labor, and expelling the Jews. Many argue that Hitler, who did call Luther a great reformer, was inspired by Luther. If a prominent religious leader such as Luther made it acceptable to hate Jews, imagine how widespread this was. Ask yourself this question. If you didn't know this part of history, why didn't you know this part of history? By the way, footnote, later the Lutheran Church renounced those views, but many argue that Hitler used them to legitimize his own ideas, but Hitler was crazy. 1555, Jews in Italy, forced into ghettos. Remember the yellow circle? This time they're made to wear yellow hats outside of the ghetto. In 1648, 100,000 Jews are killed in the Ukraine. Up until 1772, Jews weren't permitted in Russia, and then we get to 1925, Mein Kampf. Hitler. But it wasn't just in Germany. This disease, again, we all have blood on our hands, spreads to the United States. In 1939, the St. Louis shows up. This is a German ship carrying Jewish refugees. It was denied entry into the U.S. We wouldn't take them. We turned the ship around, knowing that they were headed towards their death. By 1945, somebody had effectively tried to exterminate the Jews. Oh, Hitler was very effective. 67% of all European Jews were murdered. Nearly 6 million out of 8.8 .8 million. Think of this, America, because that was done without any real technology. Imagine an uprising now. Imagine these kinds of ideas with full GPS and other state-of-the-art technologies. How would anyone escape that? Or even better, if you're all gathered in one place, like Israel, and somebody wants to vaporize you because Allah says it's your job to vaporize, imagine what could be done. Crazy? Watch this. The number of years will know all the people of the Sahai and the Mustawtinians that the coming to Palestine was for the great destruction that Allah wants to give the human beings from the evil. Okay. Okay. We all know what Hitler did, even though people like Ahmadinejad deny what Hitler did. But I want to show you what else was happening around the same time, mainly in the Middle East. It's gone under the radar for some unknown reason, and it explains almost everything you see in the Middle East. It explains why they want to drive the Jews into the sea. It explains why they say the Holocaust never happened. By the end of this program, my hope is, the only thing that will remain unexplained in your mind is why the world who promised never ever again doesn't see the old hatreds brewing once again or if they do see i mean i don't know how you can miss the protest and the chance of jew 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 if they do see why don't they care i think i'm going to utter the words that i don't think i've ever said before i agree with chuck schumer wow that seems weird chuck schumer said something i i found pretty amazing and I want you to see it. The reason there's not peace in the Middle East is very simple. It's because the majority of Palestinians and the majority of Arabs don't believe there should be an Israel. It's plain and simple. And anyone who tries to figure out, try to figure out a way to solve this conflict without realizing that truth will never get anywhere. That is true. Now, the left is all up in arms because, as we have seen, their support with the Freedom Flotillas and other Palestinian causes 
they are not, they don't care about Israel or the Jews. They know this will put the whole world in play and put the Western world on the ropes. They're trying to convince the world that the Palestinians are the ones who are being oppressed by Israel. But when you see how steeped in hate the traditions of prominent groups such as the Muslim Brotherhood are, it becomes very clear that Chuck Schumer is right. My gosh, I've said it twice. I want to take you back to 1921. Mohammed Almin al Husani. He is appointed as the Grand Mufti. That's the teacher of Islamic law. He was, grand, he was the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. He was the most prominent Arab figure in Palestine. He also happened to be one of the most bigoted human beings of all time. This is when Jerusalem and all this territory was owned by the British. He urged followers to kill the Jews wherever you find them. Throughout the late 1920s and 30s, he led violent riots opposing the establishment for a national home for the Jewish state in Palestine. His resistance caught the attention of Hassan al-Banna. Who is that? This is the guy who in 1928 founded the group called the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. Seeking to expand the scope of the group, he recruited leaders from surrounding nations. He allied with the Mufti to represent the Brotherhood in Palestine. Well, as it turns out, this guy also hated the Jews. What a coincidence. So their jihad included mass demonstrations in Egyptian cities, and their slogans were, down with the Jews, get the Jews out of Egypt and Palestine. Basically, well, these are actually more tame than what you're seeing um, being touted now on the streets of Egypt. They published a regular column it was called The Danger of the Jews in Egypt, and they called for the boycott of Jewish goods. Believe it or not, it gets much, much worse than this. It turns out that the Grand Mufti, remember the guy with the funny hat, he, um, he made a new friend, and his new friend was in Germany. They shared a common trait. His new friend was none other than Adolf Hitler. There they are together meeting in person. The Mufti sent him 15 drafts of declarations he wanted Germans and Italy to make concerning the Middle East. He was later sought for war crimes for his role in heavily recruiting for the SS, the Nazi Party's elite military unit that was responsible for many of the deaths in the Holocaust. It is estimated that his role, the Mufti, led to hundreds of thousands of Jews being murdered. By the way, he was, they believe, allowed to escape by, who would have guessed it, the French. Now, the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, Albana, was also an admirer of the Fuhrer and wrote him frequently. So close was the relationship, and so common was the enemy, that during the 1930s, the Brotherhood even ended up becoming an arm of the Nazi intelligence and propaganda. And the Nazis were happy to help. They provided the Brotherhood with funds, men's, weapon, propaganda training, anything they needed. What once was a small little group fledgling to stay alive here, they, they grew into a million strong, thanks in large part to the Nazi support. They helped mainstream Jew hatred in the entire Arab world. In fact, it grew so, so strong that Persia changed its name to Iran in 1935, due in large part to the influence of the Nazis. Iran means Aryan. The propaganda broadcast became so popular uh, during the most, uh, most of the war, um, everybody was listening to it. And if you think that was then, well, let me give you a comparison. Here's al Qaradawi. Remember him? This is the current Muslim Brotherhood leader who sounds just like Hitler. This guy has a broadcast every week that is heard and seen by 40 million Arabs every week. Now, how about the part of the story that nobody seems to be concerned about? Tying it right back today. This is... Uh, a story that we told you last week. I haven't seen it anyplace else. A group of Egyptians have now proclaimed the establishment of a new Nazi party. But they say, and no, it's, a, it's in a contemporary frame of reference, as if the problem with the Nazis were the outdated uniforms. More in just a second. We're talking a little bit about the Middle East, and... Um, 
I know this seems like it doesn't relate a lot to your life today, but it does, because I believe the Western way of life is at stake, and this is the final play. Uh, things will start to shake apart. You will start to see Europe um, start to shake apart. The economies of the world, the currencies of the world will start to shake apart, and um, uh, we will be more and more active in places like Libya, and then the world will gather to chase the Jews into the sea, and that will spend the, uh, uh, spell the end of the West unless we stand together. You hear a lot about the players in the Middle East, like Hamas and Hezbollah, but the truth is most people don't have a clue. We don't know anything about them. I was the same until recently. I want to show you who they are and what I have found about them. A lot of it is pretty easy. Hezbollah was created back in 1982. It was a group of Islamic Revolutionary Guards from Iran. The goal was to spread the Islamic Revolution across the Arab world. Where did that revolution come from? Well, the revolution that was inspired by the Ayatollah Khomeini in Iran. These are the people that are pushing for the new Arab Spring now. Their time has come. At least that's what they believe. Iran's own revolution was started by this guy, and he believed, and so does Hezbollah, that they can make it happen elsewhere. This time, it's for the entire world. Hezbollah is obviously directly tied to Iran and often acts in its behest. Before 9-11, Hezbollah was known um, as the organization that was responsible for more American deaths than any other terrorist organization. Why? They first appeared on everybody's radar in 1983, the Marine Barracks bombing, which took the lives of 241 of our troops. Now, I told you earlier about the roots, uh, the roots of the Mufti. Remember, that was the original Mufti. He was a key figure for Muslims in Palestine, especially since he was anti-British and anti-Jewish. Have it? Then we have Hamas. Now. Most people don't really understand that Code Pink is standing with Hamas. All these people are standing with Hamas. Hamas grew out of the Muslim Brotherhood. Yes, the same Muslim Brotherhood that our Director of National Intelligence, James Clapper, claimed was largely secular, and they, they hated violence. The founder and the spiritual leader of Hamas was coordinating with the Muslim Brotherhood's political activities in Gaza in the 1970s. He then went on to found Hamas on the local political arm of the Muslim Brotherhood in 1987. A year later, the Hamas Charter was written and published. It specifically rejected the Muslim Brotherhood's policy of non-violence. It is also riddled with anti-Semitism. Please um, make sure this is up at glenbeck.com and, and read the Hamas Covenant, as they call it. Right in the charter, and I'm going to read directly from it and quote, quote, the day of judgment will not come about until Muslims fight the Jews, killing the Jews, when the Jew will hide behind stone and trees, and the stones and trees will say, oh Muslims, oh Abdullah, there is a Jew behind me, come and kill him. Why is anyone talking about the plight of the Palestinians when we're talking about being in bed with people that say things like this? This is either going to help clear things up and make things make more sense or less sense. You won't understand the actions of our country and our leaders and the whole Western world, quite honestly. But things after you hear this make a little more sense on what you're hearing from the Middle East. This quote is from the spiritual leader of the Muslim Brotherhood. He spoke a few months ago in Cairo following the return after Egypt's democratic revolution. First time he could speak there, hundreds of thousands of people showed up. But back in 19, uh, I'm sorry, in 2009, remember, he said this. على كرسي متحرك فأطلق رصاصة على أعداء الله اليهود. That sounds an awful lot like the Hamas Charter, doesn't it? We have gotten an awful lot of criticism um, on this program whenever we talk about the Nazis. 
well, you know what, get over it. The fact is, however, you don't have to go back to Hitler to find violence and vicious hatred and the desire to exterminate an entire race of people. You only have to turn on your news, check the headlines, you'll see it right before your eyes, but most in the mainstream media will not tie this stuff together. These are people who surround a tiny little country, Israel. These are people who have been trying to wipe out the Western way of life. The same people who flew planes into the World Trade Center. The same people the radicals on the left in America are teaming up with to destroy the Western way of life through Israel. This is why we have to wake up. We have to stand up and be counted. Stand up and restore courage. Stand for Israel now. They are terribly, terribly alone. Does America still stand with Israel? It's our only true Middle East ally. Do we still stand? Tonight I was just talking, uh, I was just talking to one of my producers and I said, uh, you know, I don't know if anybody even cares. Um, I really I have no idea. Um, I just know what I'm supposed to do, and I'm hoping it connects with somebody in America and the rest of the world. Tonight we've been going through a lot of history. It's all available at glenbeck.com. I urge you to read it for yourself, share it with your friends, question everything. Don't take anything I say for um, gospel, because it's not. We do our own homework. I suggest you do yours. You'll have a better understanding of the hatred that is happening now in the Middle East and you'll understand the roots of it, and you'll be able to understand which side of the argument you need to be on. Check it out at glenbeck.com. There's also another story today from a book by Ben Shapiro. Ben Shapiro is going to be on my radio program tomorrow, um, but he wrote uh, a book, and he's got a quote in it from one of the founders of uh, the children's show, Sesame Street, admitting to liberal propaganda with our kids. My wife read that to me last night. We both looked at each other and went, no. It's not much of a surprise to anybody who has seen the show, but here is the propaganda that the Muslim children in the Middle East are subject to. It's a little different. زواحف مؤذية من حشرات ضارة من ميكروبات فتاكة خطرها أدنى بكثير من خطر اليوم صهيون في الأرض طاغي وضار ولادي على الطامعين الطغاة براكين توشك على الانفجار ببنين تاشن يشان دو خيلي خوشت شدن هذا فكي استفادة مكونا هن موضوع قديمية it's unbelievable. This is what's on their television. Remember, after 9-11, when the cries were all heard all across the Middle East, that it was the Jews, that the Jews had advance warning. Ahmadinejad thinks this. He said, and I quote, no Zionists were killed in the World Trade Center because one day earlier they were all told not to go to their workplace. So. No Jews died, really? Yes, according to those in the Middle East, it was all just a Jewish conspiracy. Ahmadinejad also thinks there was a big Jewish conspiracy trying to cause war in the Middle East. He just warned about that just the other day. Just today, he reiterated his anti-Zionist beliefs, quote, today, we must see to it that Iran and Egypt are two developed, powerful countries, anti-arrogance and anti-Zionist. Remember when they made fun of me, for saying that those two countries would ever come together and be like-minded. Well, if you know history, you know that that's not so crazy. They said it in the 1920s in Germany. Mein Kampf was published in 1925, and by 1945, six million Jews had been murdered. Because no one, they all say, everyone in Germany will say to you today, we didn't know. America, we won't have that excuse. You know. Your neighbors know. They're burying their heads. We must not do it. If you really want to find the oppressed, you can find oppressed people on all sides. 
But if you look at the oppressed throughout history, if you want to really find a group of people that have been kicked out of every single country on earth and have never had a place to rest their head, take a look at this list again. There is clearly only one target. Look at the list over and over and over and over and over again. The Holocaust was only one time. The target is the same, the Jewish people. I believe there's no conspiracy here. The only conspiracy is why? Why? I believe so many people don't pay attention. They just don't care. Some people just allow stereotypes and hatred to fester. Many people dismiss it. Oh, they'll never do that. But there are those who know exactly what they're doing. It doesn't matter the motivation or the level of understanding. It doesn't change the meaning of their actions, nor yours. The choice is in front of each and every one of us, and we are all responsible for our own actions. The choice is coming, and I believe it's here. We must choose. Are we going to be a force for good, or are we going to be a force for evil? And remember, to not speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. In a minute, I'm going to go back to the very beginning of this program. And I'm going to show you again what happened in 175 BC that is now happening in San Francisco. And an amazing coincidence. Tonight, we are going over history. Tomorrow is an amazing program that you do not want to miss. But in this segment, I want to go back to the first date that we told you about. It was 175 BC. It was the king of Syria. This is when Syria outlawed circumcision. It was back then that the king of Syria thought the Jews were responsible for all the trouble, so he started banning things, and circumcision was one of them. I found this interesting last night as I was doing my research because uh, I had just read about San Francisco. They're trying to do the same thing. They're trying to ban circumcision. They're saying it's health reasons. Well, this is commonly practiced by Gentiles. It is commonly practiced now by Muslims, but it is also a Jewish rite. In fact, it is a token of the covenant with God. Got it? So it's practiced by a vast majority of everybody. But on the city's next election, on the ballot, um, in November, there will be a vote on that, uh, on that election to ban circumcision for boys under the age of 18. Now, it is amazing to me how you can go back in history and see the same pattern happening over and over and over again, 175 BC and now today in San Francisco. I believe it has nothing to do with health, it has everything to do with anti-Semitism. And it is evil. And I know that is quite a statement to say that ban is evil. Last night, as I was doing research for my, uh, everything that we're doing this summer, I um, closed up my notes and I went to bed. I went to bed and I opened up Genesis 17. That's where I happened to be reading last night was 17. Coincidentally, it's the part where Abram becomes Abraham. And at that time, God gives him a promise. He says, I'll make a covenant with you and your people. I'll be your God and I'll give you something else. But in exchange, you'll give me circumcision. You'll have that as a token of this. I don't know if anybody in San Francisco has a clue as to what they're doing. I don't believe they're doing this for health. Some may be. I don't believe that's where it really comes from. I don't think they understand that by banning circumcision, they are forcing a people to break a covenant with God, one of the oldest. And isn't it interesting that the covenant that they would be forcing people to break is the one that God said, you do this, and I will give you the land of Canaan for all eternity, the land of Canaan, which is now known as Israel. A coincidence? You decide.